It's time for America Outdoors Radio, the show that covers the outdoor scene across the U.S. of A. and the entire continent. Fishing, hunting, conservation, outdoor recreation, and great destinations, we cover it all every week. It's your country, your outdoors. Let's explore it together with your host, John Cruz. We start off our show today with the announcement that Weatherby, longtime makers of some very fine rifles and shotguns, celebrated the grand opening of their new headquarters in Sheridan, Wyoming last week. Weatherby was located in California, but decided a couple of years ago to make the move north because, frankly, California's taxes, politics, and politicians, well, let's just say they weren't very welcoming to this firearms manufacturer. So... A good amount of money California and Californians were getting has shifted to Wyoming, which promotes itself as a business-friendly and especially an outdoors industry business-friendly state to do business in with low taxes and lots of wide open spaces and outdoor recreational opportunities at your doorstep. In fact, Wyoming is so serious about this. They have been going to SHOT Show for the past several years to promote their state to shooting, hunting, and outdoors trade companies as a place to relocate to. And the governor himself has come along to chat with company CEOs about this opportunity. As a matter of fact, we had former Wyoming Governor Matt Mead on this program a couple of years ago at SHOT Show in Las Vegas talking about this very issue. And I'm just guessing here, I'm just guessing his conversations with the Weatherby family in 2017 at SHOT Show were probably a significant reason that company decided to make the move to Sheridan. This week on America Outdoors Radio, We'll be talking about shooting, and some of it is likely taking place with some Weatherby over and under shotguns. The shooting we're talking about involves sporting clays, skeet, and trap, and the person we'll talk to is Brett Moyes. He's the director of the National Sporting Clays Association. If you really want to get ready for hunting season this year as a bird hunter or as a rabbit hunter, getting into sporting clays this summer should help your shooting game in a really big way, and Brett will explain more about that. Turning to fishing, Dave Nelson, the owner of Nelson Outdoors in Pascagoula, Mississippi, is going to join us towards the end of the program to give us an update on Gulf Coast and freshwater fishing there. Better still, Dave's going to peer into his crystal ball and let you know about a few places near Pascagoula that you ought to try in terms of casting a line as we roll into July. We've got outdoors news from around the nation covering everything from archery to sea lions to getting women involved in the outdoors. And we've also got a great conversation coming up with Stephen Sautner. He hails from New Jersey, bought himself a cabin and 14 acres in New York's Catskills Mountains right along a trout stream. And in short order, found himself battling an energy company that wanted to use fracking to get at natural gas under his property. Stephen will tell you, both about fracking and the battle that happened there, as well as about the trout in the Catskills during a very interesting conversation about his latest book, A Cast in the Woods. But first, let's celebrate the anniversary of a program that has undoubtedly saved a lot of lives, especially the lives of children here in America. Our first guest today is coming at you from Wichita, Kansas. His name is Bill Brassard. He is the Senior Director of Communications for the National Shooting Sports Foundation. Bill, great to have you on the air. What the heck are you doing in Kansas? <laughs> well, we will be talking pretty soon about our Project Child Safe program, and that's what brings me to Kansas along with an outdoor communicators group called the Professional Outdoor Media Association. And with them and the Wichita Police Department, we have launched our Project Child Safe gun safety program in the city, and we're providing them with gun locks and encouraging people to review their storage of their firearms, especially during the summertime when kids are out of school and maybe at home or at another friend's home and maybe not as attended as they, they might be when school is in. So that's why we're here, promoting gun safety. Well, speaking 
Speaking of Project Child Safe, it is celebrating 20 years of existence today. And folks, for those of you who don't know, uh, I used to be a law enforcement officer myself, and we partnered with the National Shooting Sports Foundation with Project Child Safe. These gun lock are wonderful, and they're absolutely free to the police departments who get them and to the public who needs them. So there's no excuse not to take care of your firearms and lock them up so that they are safe from children's hands so they don't hurt themselves. So how did NSSF come up with the concept of this, and and just how popular has this program been? Yeah, well, of course, the firearms industry has always been a proponent of secure storage of of their products and keeping them out of the wrong hands, particularly children. And uh, Project Child Safe just sort of formalized that effort into one grand program. And it started in five cities. I was there at the very beginning and have been privileged to be with the program uh, for the entire 20 years. And we started in five cities uh, working to promote safe gun handling and secure storage when the gun is not in use. And now we are in every state, including the U.S. territories, and have more than 15,000 law enforcement uh, partners. So any community can request free gun locks through their law enforcement partner at projectchildsafe.org. And folks, there's a lot of states that require secure storage of your firearms. So uh, this is a great way to address that. Another project that the National Shooting Sports Foundation is doing this summer is something called Safe Summer. What's that all about? Well, Safe Summer it reminds people that, you know, firearms accidents are preventable. There's really no excuse for uh, a child getting a hold of a gun or an unauthorized adult. And, and we pay particular attention to safe storage in the summer when uh, school is not in session and kids may be uh, unsupervised more than perhaps they are during the rest of the year. So it's a reminder, and it occurs during National Safety Month, which is in June, and it's a reminder to sort of review your safe storage in your home. You know, kids uh, they grow from small kids to teenagers, and they, you know, they know that there are firearms in the home, and so it's important for you to use the safe storage device that's right for your home situation to keep guns out of the wrong hands. Another initiative that the National Shooting Sports Foundation has been involved with, I think this one was rolled out at SHOT Show back in 2017, but it continues to go forward, the Protect the People You Love initiative. Why don't you tell our listeners about that? Yeah, that's actually a new PSA, uh, uh, really uh, more recent, uh, just a, a few weeks old. And its message is don't assume that children are unaware of the firearms in your home. They most likely know that you have firearms. And so we encourage parents to talk to their kids about gun safety. And, you know, if they're not quite sure what to say uh, when ha- having that conversation, uh, we have a very good video with champion shooter and mom, Julie Golub, and she covers, you know, the, what the message is to very young children and how to talk to older children, to teens uh, who may want to get involved with the shooting sports. And so uh, we really encourage parents to talk to their kids about gun safety. Well, as I often do, uh, I misunderstood something and I clearly misunderstood this initiative. I thought (laughs) this was the one that had to do with partnering with firearms retailers, uh, especially gun shops, to have them be on the lookout for people who might be having mental health issues and to steer them in the right direction to get help. Right. That was the initiative that we launched at our trade show, and that is a suicide prevention partnership that we have with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And uh, we've developed a kit for firearms retailers and shooting ranges that help educate their staffs on warning signs and risk factors and, and also helps provide information to customers on uh, you know where to find pr- professional help if someone in your family is going through a difficult time and reminds them to make sure those firearms are securely stored because when a firearm is securely stored and somebody uh, is having suicidal thoughts, it really puts time and distance between the person reaching a, a point where they might want to harm themselves and accessing a method uh, to do themselves harm. And, and in that pause, you know, a person can get professional help and go on and lead a, a very fruitful life. Absolutely. So as you just heard, folks, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, they are an advocate for the shooting sports, but they are also an advocate for firearm safety. If you want to learn more about this great organization, the website is simple, NS 
nssf.org. That's nssf.org. You can find out more about everything we just talked about. You can find out about the National Shooting Sports Foundation, and you can find out about SHOT Show that they will be putting on once again in January in Las Vegas, Nevada. Bill, always a pleasure to have you on America Outdoors Radio. Thanks, John. There's a place where the fishing is year-round, where the sun shines 300 days a year. The wineries and breweries are right downtown. The hiking and cycling offer spectacular views you just don't get in the big cities. Fortunately, the place is real and vibrant. It's the Dalles, Oregon, just 90 short minutes from Portland, along the gorgeous Columbia River, where the adventures are limited only by your imagination. Find out more at explorethedalles.com. We've been telling you about Sportsman's Cove Lodge in Southeast Alaska for a while now, and there's a reason. They are the only Alaska Lodge we talk about on this show. It's because they're truly Alaska's best lodge. The adventure starts with a float plane ride from Ketchikan, after which you'll get the chance to experience some of the best hospitality, food, and wonderful people you'll ever meet. Wildlife is abundant, from bears and deer to eagles and whales, and let's not forget the reason you're here, the fishing. Halibut, salmon, lingcod, rockfish, true cod, and more. It's all waiting for you in abundance at Sportsman's Cove Lodge. Book your trip today at Alaska's Best Lodge. Com. That's Alaska's Best Lodge.com for Sportsman's Cove Lodge. Looking to reel in the marketing opportunity of a lifetime? Then set the hook because we've got it right here. America Outdoors Radio has sponsorships available, and we offer an affordable platform to reach thousands of listeners interested in fishing, hunting, and the outdoors. Find out more by contacting host John Cruz through his website at AmericaOutdoorsRadio.com. That's AmericaOutdoorsRadio.com. But hurry, if you wait too long, this big opportunity might just get away. That's AmericaOutdoorsRadio.com. This year, my daughter is deer hunting for the first time, and what she learns is more important than bagging that first buck. Responsibility, safety, conservation, and the beauty of our natural world. Deer hunting is an American tradition that teaches lessons for life. A message from this station and Whitetails Unlimited. Welcome back to America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz, and I am proud to introduce you to the author of a great book called A Cast in the Woods. It's been out since September, but I'm just now getting the chance to read it, and I'm really enjoying what I'm reading. The author's name, Stephen Sautner. He hails from New Jersey, but the story is set in New York. Stephen, welcome to the show. Nice to be here. Thank you. So why don't you give our listeners a very brief overview of this book, A Cast in the Woods, published by Lions Press. Sure. The book is about a fisherman, that's me, kind of obsessed with uh, fly fishing for trout, fell in love with uh, the Catskill Mountains. And for those in your audience who do not know, the Catskills is like the cradle of American dry fly fishing and has many beautiful uh, streams. And um, it's about a three-hour drive from my home, so I kept going back and forth and back and forth. And then one day I had this brilliant idea. I said, hey, I'm going to buy a cabin so I can fish more and drive less and fish whenever I wanted to, to fish. And so I bought a cabin on 14 acres on its own tiny little native trout stream, and I thought, that's it. This is going to be great. And the book is about really how... Owning what you think is going to be a simple cabin in the woods is sort of anything but simple. And <laughs> it's the story about all the things that have happened in the past decade and a half of owning this crazy place. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about fishing in the Catskill Mountains. Uh, what kind of trout are you finding there? What size are they? I mean, tell us a little bit more about the experience. Is it all stream fishing? Yes, for the most part. I mean, there are there are some small ponds um, you can hike into, but the Catskills, I would describe it as like the Ph.D. program for dry flies. There are multiple hatches uh, that come off any time of year, really, but, you know, the peak of it is in the springtime. It's all wild fish, browns and rainbows, brook trout in some of the headwater streams, and the fish can get quite large. I mean, it's 
fairly routine to catch brown trout over 20 inches and rainbows as well. But the thing that's so great about it that I love so much about it is you can find um, a single fish rising to sort of a complex hatch and maybe work on that fish for two hours and never catch it. Wow. And finally just say, you know what? You win, I lose, see ya. <laughs> and then if you hook the, if you actually hook it, for whatever reason, I don't know if there's steroids in the water, the fish in fight, fight incredibly hard. You know, rainbow trout will give you six to eight jumps. You're, you'll see your backing every now and then. I mean, it's a really, it's amazing fishing there. And that's why people have written about uh, fishing in that region for 100, 150 years. What are some of the main rivers and streams that folks are fishing here for some of these browns, rainbows, and brookies? Uh, the Delaware River, and it's, and it's to the West Branch and East Branch. The Beaver Kill is, you know, world famous. Yes. I mean, a lot of fly patterns were invented there. Um, the Never Sink River is also a world famous stream. You know, the Cool Gordon Mayfly was invented there. Um, the Hendrickson was invented in, in the Catskills. Those are the big ones. And then there's all these small streams no one's ever heard of, like the stream that flows past m- my place. I call it the six foot wide stream because, frankly, it has three names. I don't know what to call it. So I call it the six <laughs> foot wide stream because it's six feet wide and that stream has native brook trout and wild very small rainbow trout it's a headwater stream and rainbows come up there and spawn every now and then i'll see larger fish but in that stream you know a big fish might be eight inches but it's a beautiful stream and it's you know it's my own little private stream so that's it's a wonderful place uh paint the picture of the terrain for me are we talking rolling hills are we talking small mountains are we talking uh wooded forests of pine or deciduous trees well, I mean, mountains are a relative thing. You know, what, what I might call a mountain, someone in the Rockies might go, that's not a mountain. But the highest peak in the Catskills is a little over 4,000 feet. It's called Slide Mountain. The Catskills were heavily logged more than 150 years ago, but it's grown back. So it's all second growth forest. It's a lot of hemlocks pine, there's a lot of hardwoods too, farm country, and streams everywhere. You know, every time there's a little, you know, rift in the mountains, there's a, there's a stream, a small stream, six feet wide or whatever, or a big river. So it's full of interesting, varied waterways. Interesting. Now, you talk about some of the challenges that you faced being a cabin owner in your book, and one of them was one you didn't expect at all. Uh, it turns out an oil company wanted to use a method called fracking to get it oil uh, right under your property. So yeah. why don't you explain to our listeners what fracking is and what it can do to the environment? Sure. Um, fracking was uh, developed, I'm going to say, within the past 20 years. And uh, it's a method, well, I should say horizontal fracking. Basically what they do is they drill down about a mile below the ground where the natural gas is. In this case it was natural gas, not oil. And then they turn the drill bit sideways and drill a mile horizontally. So that's the first part. And then the second part is they to break up the, the gas, which is trapped in the shale, they pump underground chemicals and water and sand to unlock the gas, and the gas comes bubbling up. The issue is in the fracking fluids, which are highly t- toxic. And so when I first learned about fracking, I was like, what is it? And I did all this research. And I said, oh, my God, these fracking fluids sound horrible. And the development of the landscape, the fragmentation of the landscape. Because you put in one well pad here and then another well pad there, another well pad there. And what you've had is unbroken woods full of wildlife. Now, all of a sudden, humanity descending on those woods. And there's all sorts of ecological things that can happen when that happens. And there have been many cases of, of spills and um, fracking fluids spilling on, on sites. Um, and then there's methane migration if the well isn't properly cased. And people have complained about all sorts of issues with it. So when I found out about it, I said, well, the more I read, the the scarier it got. So I decided to fight it because, I mean, I'm on a native trout stream and I'm there to trout fish and protect the trout. And to to my mind, it was fracking was not compatible with native trout. I didn't see how the two can could coexist, not to mention all the other wildlife in the area. So I fought against it. And what happened? Fracking was banned in New York State after a long battle, um, and it started out like it was just going to happen. You know, the oil, oil co- companies had billions of dollars, and, and then there was a grassroots ca- campaign that had nothing. But slowly a movement began to take hold, 
and it took several years. And New York City got involved, and, and New York City gets its water from the Catskill Mountains. And when that happened, the, the public pressure was such that it was banned, which was an amazing day to celebrate. And was this by the Senate and the legislature? The was this, so this is by Governor Cuomo, basically said. Cuomo, we will... Yeah, it was an executive order he, All right. he, he signed. So it was, yeah, it happened uh, December 2014. Well, that is certainly a, a happy ending to what could have been an absolutely awful, awful ending to your, uh, you know, piece of paradise you had there in the mountains. So, And the thing was, the, the first tracking well they were going to plan in New York State was going to be about a three-minute walk from the front porch of my cabin. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, I didn't, I really, really didn't want that. <laughs> well, I'm glad it worked out for you. And folks, that's just one of the stories you're going to read in the book, A Cast in the Woods. If you want to get a copy, go to Amazon.com, easily available there. Look in your local bookstore, too. The book, again, A Cast in the Woods, the author, Stephen Sautner. Uh, it's a good read, folks. You're going to enjoy it. And I think it'll make for some great summer reading to get you motivated to get out there with your fly rod to a stream near you. Stephen, thanks for telling us about this today on America Outdoors Radio. Thank you very much. So you sit down and do your budget and you look at all your monthly costs and your bills and your income and it seems like there's never quite enough. You know what would really help. Finding $500 a month to help balance things out. That is the typical savings. $500 a month for a family when you switch to MediShare for your health care. And when it comes to health care sharing ministries... MediShare is really the gold standard. It's been around for 25 years and has more than 400,000 members. It's been around so long and grown so much because it works. And whether you're single or married or have kids, this could make sitting down to do a monthly budget a lot more fun. $500 a month can more than cover a car payment or pay back loans, whatever. So join MediShare and go out to dinner to celebrate. Here's the number to call. They are incredibly kind and helpful to talk to. 855-90-BIBLE. That's 855-90-BIBLE. 855-90-BIBLE. You're back with America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. In recent weeks, we've talked about preparing for hunting season out at the range. And we've talked about skeet shooting. We've talked about trap shooting. But one way to really get ready for bird hunting or rabbit hunting is by going to a sporting clays course. With us here to tell you more about sporting clays and how it'll help you improve your hunting game is Brett Moyes, the director of the National Sporting Clays Association. Brett, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, John. Glad to be here. So, Brett, sporting clays compared to skeet and trap is newer as a sport it's called golf with shotguns how did it get that reputation so similar to what you have on a golf course where every time you you move holes it's a whole di it's a completely different hole so you have a, a lot of different opportunities to see a lot of things and use every club in your bag so to speak sporting clays is the same way every time you change stations it's a new presentation so you have lots of different presentations you'll get incoming targets outgoing targets crossing targets different distances and speeds and anything that you would see essentially in a field like you're talking about while hunting you should be able to see out on the sporting clays range so for our listeners who haven't enjoyed a sporting clays course before how does it differ from your typical trap or skeet shoot so on a skeet field, as you're aware, you have a high house and a low house, two machines that you shoot from a semicircle, so you get incoming, crossing, quartering. On a trap field, you have one machine that throws all going away birds from different angles. Sporting clays course is a lot more than that. So each station that you go to would have two machines set up in a different presentation. So a typical sporting clays course is 10 stations. So two machines per station gives you 20 target presentations per round that you would shoot at. So those machines could be set at 
three yards in front of the cage going away from you or, or like on a trap field 16 yards in front of you, or they could be coming from left and right like you would see on a skeet field. They could be coming from way out in front of you, throwing at you. Um, the, the variety that is there in sporting clays versus skeet and trap is what makes it different. And I guess the other thing uh, that's unique about sporting clays when compared to skeet or trap, I mean, if you go to you know the, the local shotgun range and you're going to a trap field, I mean, the scenery might be different. But the experience is always the same. You know exactly what's going to happen, whether it's skeet or whether it's trap. But in, right. sport, in sporting clays, though, every sporting clays course is different. They're they're unique. Correct. Yeah, that, and that's what makes our game so great. Is you know on a wherever you go in the country and you shoot trap, it's the same presentation target wise as what you will shoot no matter where you go. Same situation with skeet. It's the same presentation no matter where you go. Sporting clays, every time you go to a new station, a new club, a new state, whatever the case may be, you're going to see a different target presentation um, every time you move, no matter, no matter the club, no matter the station on each course, whatever it is, the variety that is there, including the targets. You know, you shoot a standard target uh, in, in skeet and trap, a standard size target. Where in sporting clays, we have different targets. So you'll have batu targets that are really thin and they roll over. You have rabbit targets that bounce on the ground. You have um, a midi target, which is essentially a 90 millimeter target. So it's smaller than a standard target that you'll get to shoot at. There's just a lot more variety in options. Oh, that is a lot more variety and a lot more options I've ever seen as well. So here's a question for you. For most beginners, when it comes to the Sporting Clays course, uh, who may have had a little experience, you know, shooting trap, shooting skeet, what's the toughest shot that, that they usually come up against? Is it that bouncing rabbit? You know, on a standard course, typically rabbits give everybody problems just because they've never had a chance to shoot at them before. I mean, literally, unless you've been on the sporting clays course or unless you've hunted rabbits, you never shoot at a target rolling across the ground. So, yeah, that definitely gives people some problems, you know, and once you get out to some further distances, out to 40 yards or so, crossing targets and and speed variations and angles and, and anything like that can certainly make a target difficult. So you're the director of the National Sporting Clays Association, and you mm-hmm. work hand-in-hand with the National Skeet Shooting Association. Uh, why don't you tell right. our listeners a little bit about these two organizations? What do they do? So we're the governing body, both skeet and sporting clays, here in San Antonio. So, so we track all scores and points uh, for all the shoots that go on around the country. Last year, we, uh, sporting clays, we threw just over 25 million registered targets, which is a, a tournament that was held at one of our clubs. Uh, Both Skeet and Sporting have about 350 member clubs that throw registered birds each year. And and we track all of that information. So everything comes through us. We we determine the, the rules and the governance of the game. All right, so you're the the one-stop a national resource for for both sports. Now, if people want to get involved, they want to head down to the local gun club and get into sporting clays or get into skeet, do they need to be intimidated? Do they need to go out and buy a, you know, one of those beautiful skeet or trap guns or can they just go with their hunting gun to get started and expect to have a good time? I would encourage everyone to go with their hunting gun to get started. It's what you're comfortable with. It's what you know, regardless if that is a pump gun, an automatic, an over and under, whatever the case may be. You know, there's there's a spot for it in, in our game. Even, even now in sporting clays, we have events that are specifically for pump guns, so you can only shoot a pump gun. We have side-by-side events that are only for side-by-sides. We have sub-gauge events, so if it's not a 12-gauge and you shoot a 20, a 28, a 410, whatever the case may be, we offer those options as well. So you're still competing with what you're comfortable with, the gun that you've grown up with, perhaps, and and you can go out there and try the game. Now, as you get further along, if you decide you want to progress and, and get a more expensive gun or just a different gun to you, I mean, who could discourage someone from buying a new gun, you know? Uh, but the options are certainly there for anybody that wants to just bring their, bring their pump gun out, go out with your friends, uh, call your local range and talk to those guys and, uh, and get set up and get trying it. Let's talk about the expense of this sport because, uh, well, Compared to golf, for example, this is a lot cheaper, especially if you're just getting started. Well, it certainly can be, and it can also be very expensive. I mean, if you're going to go out, I mean, you can buy a shotgun for twenty-five grand if you wanted to, you know. But the the necessity to do that is not there. You know, a, a typical round of golf when you when you buy a, a a bag of balls and you go pay pay for the eighteen holes, it's uh, you know, cost you a hundred bucks. 
once you pay for your shells, your target costs are somewhere between, depending on where you're at in the country, between $35 up to $50 per 100 targets. So that's what your typical round would cost you plus your shells. So the, the opportunity is there to get into it at a relatively inexpensive price and, and just try the game out and see if it's what, what works for you. One other thing I'd like to talk about is there's a national shooting complex near San Antonio, Texas, where you're headquartered. If folks find themselves in San Antonio and want to visit, what are they going to see? So we have uh, 640 acres of what we like to refer to as uh, adult Disneyland. You know, it's all <laughs> shooting. It's all shotgun shooting. Uh, we don't we don't offer any rifle or pistol, but any sort of shotgun discipline you can come out and enjoy. We keep uh, three sporting clays courses going virtually uh, all week long. We have up to 50 skeet fields that, that we open as needed, wow. and we have another two dozen trap fields as well. Uh, so we, we have kind of our little, our little mecca here in San Antonio where you can come out and, and we offer it all. So if it's with a shotgun, you want to do it, you want to come out for the day, you can pay for your targets as you go. You can rent a shotgun here. You can buy your ammo here. We can set you up with a golf cart to go around to the stations. We can set you up with a referee, a puller to help you uh, along through the course uh, and do a little bit of anything you want to do as long as it's safe and, uh, and you're having a good time. Well, folks, I don't know about you, but I know what I'm doing the next time I go to San Antonio, Texas, besides visiting the Alamo. All right, folks, we have got to go. But the website to go to to find out more about getting involved with the National Sporting Clays Association or the National Skeet Shooting Association and its member clubs, and there's sure to be one near you, is nssa nsca.org. That's nssa dash nsca.org. Brett, thanks for telling us about this today on America Outdoors Radio. Thanks, John. There's no more majestic, magical, adventuresome country than the western United States of America to enjoy a great family vacation. Hello, I'm Mark Hemstreet, owner of Shiloh Inns. Shiloh Inns are still offering affordable four-star accommodations at two-star prices. Enjoy deluxe smoke-free suites, spacious pools and spas, and fully equipped fitness centers. From free high-speed internet in every room to a free continental breakfast or full hot delicious breakfast at most Shiloh Inns. There are no hidden fees like some of the big chain hotels charge. Even the kids stay free and Shiloh Inns are dog friendly. For reservations, call 1-800-222-2244 or visit our website at ShilohInns.com. Shiloh Inns, affordable excellence, American family owned and proud of it. There's a place where the fishing is year-round, where the sun shines 300 days a year. The wineries and breweries are right downtown. The hiking and cycling offer spectacular views you just don't get in the big cities. Fortunately, the place is real and vibrant. It's the Dalles, Oregon, just 90 short minutes from Portland, along the gorgeous Columbia River, where the adventures are limited only by your imagination. Find out more at explorethedalles.com. We've been telling you about Sportsman's Cove Lodge in southeast Alaska for a while now, and there's a reason. They are the only Alaska lodge we talk about on this show. It's because they're truly Alaska's best lodge. The adventure starts with a float plane ride from Ketchikan, after which you'll get the chance to experience some of the best hospitality, food, and wonderful people you'll ever meet. Wildlife is abundant, from bears and deer to eagles and whales, and let's not forget the reason you're here, the fishing. Halibut, salmon, lingcod, rockfish, true cod, and more. It's all waiting for you in abundance at Sportsman's Cove Lodge. Book your trip today at Alaska's Best Lodge. Com. That's Alaska's Best Lodge.com for Sportsman's Cove Lodge. 
Looking to reel in the marketing opportunity of a lifetime? Then set the hook because we've got it right here. America Outdoors Radio has sponsorships available, and we offer an affordable platform to reach thousands of listeners interested in fishing, hunting, and the outdoors. Find out more by contacting host John Cruz through his website at AmericanOutdoorsRadio.com. That's AmericanOutdoorsRadio.com. But hurry, if you wait too long, this big opportunity might just get away. That's AmericanOutdoorsRadio.com. Backcountry hunters and anglers, a nationwide group working to keep public lands in public hands. We've helped ban the use of drones for hunting. We help repair wildlife corridors and key riparian areas. We speak up against illegal ATV use. We collaborate with elected leaders to keep public lands in public hands. We're backcountry hunters and anglers with membership in all 50 states in Canada. Please join this dynamic conservation group. Check us out at backcountryhunters.org. NorthwestFishingReports.com is the Northwest's largest fishing reports website, featuring well over 50,000 fishing reports, videos, articles, and more, all 100% free. Catch more fish with Northwest Fishing Reports. Log on today. You're back in with America Outdoors Radio, and we've got some outdoors news stories for you. We start off congratulating Brady Ellison, representing our United States of America. He just won gold and is the new Recurve World Archery Champion. Ellison had been a top-ranked bow shooter for USA Archery for a dozen years now, but the gold medal has always eluded him until now. Ellison beat out a competitor from Malaysia recently in a one-arrow shoot-off at the championship competition and told reporters his next goal, Olympic gold. Good luck, Brady. We'll be rooting for you. Turning to women in the outdoors, as you know from recent stories on this program, women are increasingly showing up in the woods, fields, and streams of America to fish and hunt, and we want to get even more of them out there. That's why there are programs like Becoming an Outdoors Woman in 39 states that have one or multi-day clinics designed to teach women outdoor skills so they feel comfortable participating in these sports alone. One state offering a multi-day clinic this year is Ohio, where the Department of Natural Resources is holding their sixth annual Ohio Women's Outdoor Adventures Weekend from September 13th through the 15th at Mohegan. Deacon State Park. The program focuses on the basics of outdoor sports skills, giving women a chance to try activities they've never tried before. This year, they can try stand-up paddling, kayaking, power boating, fly fishing, jug fishing, shoreline fishing, gun safety, as well as shooting, archery, backyard wildlife watching, hiking, nature photography, and more. The event is open to all women aged 16 and older, though minors must be accompanied by a parent or guardian. The cost, $320 per person, but that includes lodging, five meals, and transportation between venues and evening activities. Registration is now open, but it's limited to just 120 female participants. Contact the Ohio DNR or go online to their website for more information. And if you are one of our listeners tuning in today on WMOH AM 1450 out of Hamilton or Cincinnati, this is an event you need to tell your lady friends about, and maybe some of you can register and take part in this together. As for all of you outside of Ohio, you can find out more about women's clinics and camps and activities near you at Becoming an Outdoors Woman on Facebook. In other news, this time out of the Pacific Northwest, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, in partnership with Idaho Fish and Game, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and several tribes, are applying for a permit to remove both California and stellar sea lions from the Columbia River and its tributaries. Both species were protected under the 1972 Marine Mammal Act, but... If you have ever been to the Columbia River below Bonneville Dam or around Astoria, Oregon at the mouth of the Columbia River, you know the population of both species, let's just say it's quite robust. In fact, there are so many of these sea lions in the river, they are severely impacting the numbers of adult salmon, steelhead, and sturgeon that are found in the lower Columbia. There have been past efforts to deter the sea lions from eating fish below the dams using non-lethal methods or 
even capturing them and transporting them hundreds of miles away. These methods have been unsuccessful, and several of those relocated sea lions have come right back to Bonneville Dam within days. There's some real science behind this, too. Steelhead runs were literally going extinct below Willamette Falls, and salmon runs weren't doing much better near Portland, Oregon, due to sea lion predation. The state of Oregon applied for a permit to kill a number of these sea lions. It was approved, and 33 sea lions have been removed from the Willamette River right below the falls since December. As a direct result of this, 3,200 winter steelhead returned over the falls this year in comparison to the mere 822 that made it past the sea lions below the falls in 2017. If this application is approved, you may see some serious sea lion removal taking place below Bonneville Dam in 2020, and I suspect an increased return of salmon and steelhead will follow. Next up on America Outdoors Radio, we had promised you an interview and a fishing report from Dave Nelson, the owner of Nelson Outdoors out of Pascagoula, Mississippi. But unfortunately, life got in the way. We weren't able to get Dave on the line. However, we've got another fishing report for you. We're talking to Keith Eshbaugh. He is the owner of Dutch Fort Custom Lures based in Pennsylvania, and he literally just got off the water at Lake Erie. Keith, how was the fishing today? Oh, fishing was fantastic. We did uh, walleye, we got a bunch of big sheephead, and a couple dandy smallmouth. Well, I know you have just been slaying the walleye as of late. You took out the Northwest Fishing Reports crew and filmed a TV show with them, and uh, they were showing off a lot of nice walleye on Facebook. Tell me about sheephead. That's a species I'm not really familiar with. Uh, and tell our listeners about it, too, in terms of the size, the fighting quality, and whether there's any table fare to it. Uh, well, the size, they're tremendous out here. They're like the size of garbage can lids. They fight really, really hard. They'll make your arm hurt. And you can catch 50, 60, 70 of them a day jigging, just like you would bat fishing with tubes. Yeah, sounds table like... fare, they're not very good. Okay, okay. So uh, it sounds like they're kind of equivalent to the common carp. Yes, pretty much. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I'm kind of with you on this. I don't mind catching a fish that gives me a good tug, especially if it's got some real size to it and letting it go. Uh, so good for you for catching those. As for the walleye, though, we, you and I have talked before about this. Lake Erie has just been on fire. And right now, is it the entire lake or just where you're at at Pennsylvania that's fishing really well? It is the entire lake. 200 miles of lake, everybody's catching fish. You know, it doesn't get much better than that. Uh, besides sheephead, besides walleye, Lake Erie's also known as a good bass lake too, isn't it? Yes, it's tremendous bass fishing, and we've had so much rain and east winds here, the water is still 60.5 degrees, so the bass are still in the shallows, they're on the rock piles, they're only 12 to 14 foot deep, you can catch them on tubes any kind of plastic, buzz baits, spitter baits, they hit everything. I presume these are all smallmouth bass. What is a good size Lake Erie bass? Uh, six, seven pounds. Uh, that's a good size bass anywhere you go, especially when it comes to smallmouth bass. Any other fish that we ought to be aware of in Lake Erie that people ought to be targeting this summer? Uh, we got a ton of giant white bass All right. in the 17 to 18 inch range. All right. You are giving me all sorts of reasons to come visit you and go fishing. But in the meantime, uh, let's spend about a minute and tell folks about your company, Dutch Fort Custom Lures. You're a former tournament walleye angler, and now you make these custom lures for walleye and more. Tell our listeners more about that. Yes, we make a full line of plastic spinner blades. We don't make no metal ones. They're all plastic. They're half the weight of a metal blade. They spin at half mile an hour, and we make 100 different colors. From size 2, the tiny ones, the whole way up to a musky size 12. And, folks, you'll find Dutch Fork Custom Lures all over the place. This company has grown really quick because their product line is really good. But what's the website where folks can find out more? It's www.dutchforkcustomlures.com. That's Dutch Fork Custom Lures, and that's the man behind it, Keith Eshbaugh, with a Lake Erie Fishing Report. As you just heard, it's a great time to be fishing this great lake. Thanks, Keith. All right, appreciate it.
We've got to wrap things up, but if you get a chance, check out our Facebook page at America Outdoors Radio. Like and follow us. We post things from time to time there that don't make it on this show. We've got a website, too. It's AmericaOutdoorsRadio.com. And not only can you see what's coming up on the show, but you can hear podcasts of past show there, as well as other platforms where we air. Summer has finally arrived, and with it, the promise of all sorts of activities that we can do outside. Whether it's camping for the weekend, or maybe for a week, or maybe a hike, maybe a bike, maybe a paddle, and hopefully with a fishing rod in hand so you can enjoy some time fishing for just about anything. Whether it's bass out of a pond, trout out of a stream, or maybe dipping a line in the Gulf Coast or the Pacific or Atlantic Ocean for something much bigger. Whatever floats your boat, as they say, but whatever it is that makes you happy outside, I hope you will get out there and do it in the days ahead. I also hope that you are blessed in the days ahead with good health and much more. Until next time, do remember this. It is your country and your outdoors, so get out there and enjoy it. We've been telling you about Sportsman's Cove Lodge in Southeast Alaska for a while now, and there's a reason. They are the only Alaska Lodge we talk about on this show. It's because they're truly Alaska's best lodge. The adventure starts with a float plane ride from Ketchikan, after which you'll get the chance to experience some of the best hospitality, food, and wonderful people you'll ever meet. Wildlife is abundant, from bears and deer to eagles and whales, and let's not forget the reason you're here, the fishing. Halibut, salmon, lingcod, rockfish, true cod, and more. It's all waiting for you in abundance at Sportsman's Cove Lodge. Book your trip today at Alaska's Best Lodge That's alaskasbestlodge.com for Sportsman's Cove Lodge.